we go. So welcome everybody to our series of online learnings, uh, which is a joint effort between the Jewish National Fund and Alexander Muss High School in Israel. Um, we find ourselves in strange and interesting times, and we have brought this series, this daily series together every day at one o'clock to learn from our amazing, extraordinary teachers. Today, we have the pleasure and the privilege of learning with Akiva Gersh. Akiva is originally from New York and made Aliyah to Israel in 2004. Since 2007, he's been teaching Jewish history and modern Israel at the Alexander Moss High School in Israel, where he guides visiting high school students to the story of the Jewish people, mainly through, just lost my screen, mainly through Tiulim, to historical, cultural, religious, and ecological sites around the country. He's also a contributing blogger at the Times of Israel, as well as a musician. In 2010, Akiva created Holy Land Spirit, an uplifting and spiritual musical experience for Christian groups visiting Israel that fosters interfaith celebration, understanding, and dialogue. In 2017, Akiva published his first book entitled Becoming Israeli, a compilation of blogs and essays about the experience of making Aliyah and acclimating to life in Israel. Akiva holds a BA in Religious Studies from Brown University, an MA in Jewish Education from Yeshiva University, and received rabbinical ordination from Yeshivat Sulam Yaakov in Yerushalayim. He and his wife live in Pardes Chana with their four children. Akiva, thank you for spending the time with us to teach with us, to learn with us today. And without further ado, thank you, Akiva Gersh. It is all yours. Okay, thank you, Greg, and thank you, everybody, for joining in. Really great to be here and be able to share during these really uh, challenging and unique times. And uh, fortunately, we have these incredible technologies that allow us to continue to learn, even if it's in a different way, and uh, to get together and come together to support each other, to learn with each other, from each other. And, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, an idea in, uh, in Jewish thought that dates back thousands of years that the refuah comes before the makkah, right? That, uh, that the solution or the healing comes before the actual um, um, ailment, let's call it. And I feel like we're seeing this through, you know, online technology, especially Zoom. You know, we, you know, Zoom has existed for years. You know, most people either didn't know about it or never used it. And now that we're in these very trying times and we're isolated from each other physically and we're in our own homes for long periods of time, 12 days and running in Israel, um, we have this great technology that we can use to get together and it's really great. I've already used it a couple of times with my class that unfortunately left a week early from Israel and it was so painful, but at least we got most of our program in. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. So again, thank you, Greg, and thank you, everybody. Let's begin. So what I want to what I want to do, first of all, uh, I remember Greg said after Lior uh, Sinai's uh, class the other night on Sunday night that it's a tough act to follow. Is that Monday night or Sunday night? I forget which one. I think it was Monday night. Uh, I feel like now I have three tough acts to follow uh, after Lior and Jacob and Lisa. And it's such, been such great online learning. I've been ta uh, you know, checking in and tapping into all these classes. And I'm just uh, happy to, to add uh, another class in this string uh, of, of events. I'm going to do something a little bit different um, with this time that we have together tonight. I'm actually going to take you through more or less as much as possible, obviously, uh, you know, understanding the limitations and restrictions, but to take you through a to you, uh, a, a trip, a field trip um, of, of, of hours of AMHSI um, to the Golan Heights. And it's really uh, fitting because that's the, if I remember correctly, right? That's the one Tiul that we didn't get in with our students. Uh, we, we did everything but one Tiul. And uh, this would have been the Tiul that, that, that we would have ended with, uh, a two-day trip up to the north, including uh, a good solid day plus in the Golan Heights, exploring it in many ways and many levels. And this is what we're going to be doing um, the next 45 minutes or so through this PowerPoint, through our talking, through our sharing and the like. I'll say a, a few things just as words of preface in a way um, before we jump into the PowerPoint and use it to guide our learning um, is the... the it's interesting, you know, it, I think it's an interesting question for our school, like why do we wrap up our programs, whether they're eight week programs, four month programs, summer, you know, uh, two week uh, programs with eighth grade groups, the, the, the diversity programs that we have, 
almost always our last well, our, our last adventure, our last experience with our students is to the Golan Heights. And I think it's a worthwhile question, like why? Like why the Golan? There's like a million places that are awesome and beautiful and, and, and afford us great opportunities to learn in Israel. Why do we end with the Golan? And I feel on some level that question is really the essence of, of our learning tonight. Like what is it about the Golan? Why do we want to end there? On some level, on a simple level, like we can say, well, you know, there's, you know, so much more modern history in the Golan Heights and it makes sense to go there and uh, the last, you know, teal because we learn in a chronological way. So we go there to kind of like, you know, bring back, you know, bring up the, the most modern issues and events in Israeli history. And, and it's, it just makes sense chronologically. And while that answer, I think, is totally true, I think there's another deeper answer. And I hope that we see this in our learning tonight, that there's something about the Golan. There's something about the, the, the Golan. It, it's kind of a funny thing to say, but it's like, it's so Israeli. It's so Israel. Um, the Golan Heights, when you go there, when you see it, when you experience it, when you walk it, when you even just drive through it, uh, you, I, I personally feel, and I think a lot of people would agree, that you just feel something about the place, about the land, about the region, that just, oh, you just feel that Israel, Israeli feeling uh, so strongly. Uh, many times I've gone there just literally just up to drive, to drive for a couple hours, and it's big enough that you can do that, uh, just to be in, in that space and in that land. And um, again, I hope that's something that we see as a theme in, in our learning tonight. Um, I'll just say this uh, uh, as we jump in that, there's a lot I want to share, um, as you can already see from the title, The Magic of the Golden Heights, History, Nature, Security, and Politics. That's a lot for 45 minutes. Um, we're not going to get to the depths of the depths. And I'm going to bring up a lot of issues and events and moments in Israel history that we're, we're just going to mention and, and, and then move on. And just knowing that these are topics, you know, uh, unto themselves that, you know, require and, you know, could use our hours and hours of learning and talking about them alone. And, and I think we'll see a, a few of those examples through the, through the course of our learning together. So I just wanted to say that we just don't have the time to go to the depths of, of, of everything. Um, and yeah, I think with that, we'll, we'll kind of jump in. So just kind of seeing the pictures on the screen right now, getting some feelings about the Golan, what it's already, you know, connected to. Um, I want to skip already to the next slide. And start with a question that on some level will open up to our guiding question uh, or one of our guiding questions, but just a very first simple question. When did the Golden Heights become part of Israel? I should have had an A, B, and C on the screen. I didn't. I just thought of that just like three minutes ago. But let me just say this. When did the Golden Heights become part of Israel? And you can answer in the comments either A, 1948, B, 1967, or C, 1973. When did the Golan Heights become part of Israel? A, 1948, B, 1967, C, 1973. So I see a lot of the comments on. All right, we'll just wait for a few more maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Looks like we have a lot of smarty pants in the group tonight, which is nice. A lot of Jewish history mavens, awesome. So the answer is B, it's 1960. Okay, uh, that the Golan Heights becomes technically a part of, let's, I, I, we should even be more specific, the state of Israel. Okay, um, and that's B, that's 1967. Great, let's just go to the next slide and, and just understand that a little bit. I think it's interesting because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm literally like, you know, my teal, and I would share it with my students when we get up to the high. Right? We drive, we drive, we drive for a few hours from Hoda Sharon. We maybe make a stop somewhere for a bathroom break, and then we get to uh, a place that I'll show you uh, in a slide coming up soon either Tel Facher, Mitzvah Gadot. We get out of the bus, we find a nice place to sit, and we start to talk. And I tell my students, Welcome to the Golan. Let's understand the Golan. Right? And one of the first questions I, I ask is, you know, when did the Golan Heights become part of Israel? Now for our longer, let's just go back a couple slides. Um, perfect. Um, for our longer academic groups, we've already learned the background history to the Golan Heights. They already learned this, you know, already in the first week as we do current events and news and, and all kinds of other things that brings to their attention, one, the Golan Heights, the existence of, and two, when it became part of the state of Israel in 1967. Right, something I drill into my students' head, like 1967, 1967, it's this very, very important year, right? 1948, 1967, kind of this duo of very important years. And I kind of jokingly, but also seriously tell them, if you're ever taking a test about Israeli history and they ask you for a year, and you don't know the answer, just say 1967, chances are you'll be right. 
All right, so the Golan Heights becomes part of the state of uh, Israel in 1967. But then the question is like, why? Why wasn't it a part of Israel before 1967? So now we look at the map. All right, we look at the map of what was the UN partition plan of 1947. Okay, uh, no, no, go back one. Yes, there, thank you. This is the map of 1947, the UN partition plan after 30 years or so of a British mandate, uh, which they were given. Let's just remind ourselves because this is really important. Remind ourselves, maybe not specifically for this uh, PowerPoint in this class, but just general knowledge. Remember that the British mandate, the British were given the mandate on Palestine by the League of Nations, created after World War I, specifically to uh, facilitate the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. Okay, that was their job. That's why they were there. Okay, um, after about 30 years when, you know, all Balagan broke out and the Arabs and the Jews and the British, you know, find themselves in this triangular conflict, the British, you know, threw up their hands and said, we're done. We can't do this anymore. And after World War II, they go to the UN and uh, they say, you deal with it. It's, it's your problem now. You figure out a solution. There were many in the British government who quietly, silently, maybe not so silently, we're wishing and hoping that the British uh, would be told by the UN, you know what, we don't want to deal with it either. It's too complicated. You just deal with it, Con you know, continue to be the, the trustee, so to speak, of, the, uh, of Palestine. That didn't happen because the UN sent UNSCOP in 1947 and, and toured the, 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 the land for a few months to talk to the Arabs and the Jews and really understand the situation or try to on the ground as best they could in a few months. And as a result, they drew this map. That's a lot of background history, not specifically for the Gulam, but it's to understand the, the, how what was left of Palestine in 1947 after Transjordan was split off in 1922, how that land got split up by the UN, right? So we see this map, this was the original plan, and we can tell on this map, I just looked north of the Kinneret, I, I wish I could point, but I really can't, but you can see the Dead Sea, just go straight up north, thank you, Greg. You can see the Kinneret, and to the right and north of the Kinneret is the Golan Heights, right? And it's not part of the, the state of Israel, it's not part of this plan. And why is that? Anybody wanna say in, uh, in, in the comments? Why wasn't the Golan Heights part of this map? Who wants to say it? It's Syria, Roland, thank you, very good. Okay, and Jackson. All right, it was part of Syria, it had nothing to do with the mandate. It wasn't part of the British mandate whatsoever. It's part of the French mandate, which eventually becomes part of Syria. Okay, all right, so the Golan Heights is not even part of the story. Yes, there is some history there with the early years of Zionism. I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that. Land was bought many, many thousands of dunams, acres were bought in, in the Golan Heights during the early years, the early decades of the, of the, uh, of the Zionist movement. Forget that, right, for now. All right, when the, when the mandate was made, Right, the Golan Heights was not part of it. So it wasn't even a thought that the Golan Heights would be part of the state of Israel because it was part of Syria, okay? Let's just go to the next slide. All right, and we'll see in the next slide, just to give us some context, right? Uh, zoom out a little bit uh, to the, into the Middle East and understand the size of the Golan Heights. While compared to Israel, it's a pretty sizable chunk of land. And, and people feel that when they go there, when you look uh, compared to Syria, right, it's really just a tiny percentage of their, uh, of their land, less than 1% of their land. If you're talking about square miles, that's not a political statement, okay? I'm just uh, stating that fact, just a kind of the visual relation between the Golan Heights and, and, and compared to Israel and compared to, to Syria. Let's go to the next slide again. All right, uh, I just added this slide just to see. This is a very typical uh, uh, map of Israel and the occupied territories. Okay, we're not going to go into the politics of occupation and this, this, and that, right? But just look. Uh, here we have a, a map of the state of Israel and the territories that people will either call occupied or, or disputed. And you have the Gaza Strip in green, you have the West Bank, and you have the Golan Heights. And this map is very surprising to a lot of people, including Israelis, who have a certain view of, of Gaza, for sure, especially since we left there in 2005, right? Both of our, our civilians and our military, and also, of course, the West Bank, right? Uh, with its, you know, couple million uh, Palestinians living there and hundreds of thousands of Israelis living in Israeli settlements. But then when they see the Golan in green also, as if equating the Golan Heights to the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, that's very confusing to people. Right? That's very kind of like, huh, why is that? Right? Why would the Golan be treated by this map that's you know, being shared in the international community in the same way? Why is the Golan equated and on the same level uh, as the West Bank and the Gaza Strip? That's something that either people know already, all right, or if not, we'll talk about that um, 
as as we go on, or basically right now. Can you remind me what you know? Actually, I can do it on my own computer. This is what my next slide is. Okay, not yet. We're not at the next slide. All right. Um, but yes, you know, the answer is because it was part of Syria in 1967, the Golan Heights uh, was conquered by the IDF. And I'm not gonna go into the six they were right now. This is not the topic of this talk, but to understand the Golan, you need to understand just a little bit. So I'm gonna give it over super briefly, right? In just a few sentences, 1967, all right? Three Arab countries are threatening uh, Israel with destruction, with attacks le led by Egypt. All right, but also joined in by Jordan and Syria, all right? And Israel was basically facing a, a situation where many in the world and even within Israel thought it was gonna be like another Holocaust, all right? After 19 years or so of, of, of the state of Israel existing, it was nice, Mazal Tov, it's, that's it, it's over. And Israel's not gonna be able to withstand this next uh, war. Um, obviously we know um, that Israel wins this war in, in, in six lightning speed days. And not only that, not only defends itself, not only continues to survive, but obviously defeats three armies simultaneously, Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. And as a result, gains land from each one of them, right? From Egypt gains the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, from Jordan, the West Bank, right? Or Judea and Samaria, however you like to call it. And from Syria, the Golan Heights, okay? So the Golan Heights were, was in uh, Syrian hands up until 1967. Again, this might be a review for most people, um, but I think it's important to know, to understand that the, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in, into the class, that the Golan, I'm sorry, that, that, that the whole conflict, if you look at the history of the Six Day War, the whole conflict, the whole war begins with the conflict on the border between Israel and Syria, all right? 1948, War of Independence, which really begins in 1947. Uh, Arab nations join in 1948, the second that the British leave. It continues in 1949. People might know that there's no peace treaties drawn between Israel and its Arab neighbors, but there is an armistice agreement. One of those armistice agreements is written up between Israel and Syria. A borderline or an armistice line, I should call it more accurately, is drawn between Israel and Syria, just like it was drawn between Israel, Jordan, Israel, Egypt, and Israel and Lebanon. Uh, that law, that line was not supposed to be an official border. Even the Arab countries didn't want it to be an official border, whatever. Uh, a line was drawn and the Golan Heights, right, was, again, this is going back to 1949, was uh, still within Syria. And the Syrians will use this uh, land um, in a way that will benefit them and their militaristic goals against Israel. We'll touch uh, on that a little bit later. But I just wanted to say that the conflict begins right here. The Sixth Day War begins on the border right, between Israel and Syria. You can, see, uh, you can see on a macro level for those first 18, 19 years of Israel's existence, there was this tension on the border. Right, but specifically leading up uh, in, in the years leading up, even the months leading up to the Six Day War, the tension uh, increases, increases, and there's Syrian attacks on northern Israel. Israel, of course, you know, retaliates, and that escalates the the situation. Syria calls for Egypt to help. I'm not going to go further with that story because again, that's a, a complicated story, but Syria basically calls out for Egypt to help and eventually it, it joins in and leads the way in the Six Day War. And of course, Israel attacks Egypt first in the Six Day War. Again, putting all that Six Day War history to the side. Um, uh, we'll touch base on this a little bit more, but just to kind of on a micro level to understand that the, really the whole conflict begins with Syria and specifically with the Golan. And that will one day lead in 1967, obviously, to Israel winning the Golan Heights in addition to other lands as well. Let's go forward. <laughs> okay, so um, one of our kind of underlying questions, and I asked this right away to my students, after I you know, remind them of the, of the history we already learned in class, all right? Um, basically, uh, you know, which what I just said now it was a sum up of. I, I asked them the question, you know, like, Let's be honest, right? If, if, if we look, if we remember the slides we just looked at, let's just be very straight up and honest. The Golan Heights was never part of the state of Israel before 1967, and it wasn't meant to be part of the state of Israel, right? According to the UN partition plan, okay? As well as the armistice agreement in 1949, okay? When we conquered the Golan Heights in 1967, we conquered a piece of land from a different country, that country being Syria, obviously. Okay, so that begs, you know, and, and that makes, I'm, I'm sorry, Greg, for if this isn't right, can you just go back one slide? All right, um, 
let's just look at this map because what makes the Golan different than Gaza or the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, uh, and this is an important note, is that the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are, are very different pieces of land than the Golan. Why? Because they didn't belong technically to any country, right, in the years between 1949 and 1967. Why is that? You might say, but Egypt controlled Gaza and, and Jordan controlled the West Bank. Yes, they took it for themselves, but they weren't allowed to. And according to international law, what they did was illegal. It was an illegal illegal occupation of those lands by Egypt and Jordan um, because those lands according to the UN partition plan at least was supposed to be part of this new Arab state in Palestine which never came to be because when the Arabs you know did not uh, approve of of the UN partition in 1947, and two of their lands, what was left of it, what were left of it, uh, got taken again by Egypt and Jordan. Okay, again, there's a lot more history and politics there than just that, but I'm not going to go down that road because that will get us lost. Let's go forward again. All right. So let's go back to the question: Should Israel one one thing back? Sorry, should Israel be willing to give back the Golan Heights to Syria in exchange for peace? Knowing what we know. Right, either what you knew coming into this class, or what I just reminded you of just now, or maybe just taught you, right, just now. Should Israel be willing to give back the Golan Heights to Syria in exchange for peace? Let me just uh, explain what that means. All right, and we're going to look at the comments really quickly. Okay, but you can start to uh, say, you know, your opinions in the goal, in, in the comments, and if you have like a one sentence uh, reason why, feel free to say that as well. Okay, but if we give back the Golan Heights. All right, it means one, peace with Syria, which means peace with another Arab neighboring country of ours, right? after Egypt in 1979, Jordan in 1994. All right, and it also means that in order to, for Syria to, to make this agreement with us, they would have to cut their ties to Iran, to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, cut their ties to terrorism, and of course, cut, their, <laughs> cut off their desire to destroy the state of Israel, which has pretty much been their policy uh, throughout the 71 plus years of, of Israel's existence. So that's the question. Let's just look in the comments a little bit for some people's uh, thoughts. I don't know, Greg, do you want me to read it? Do you want to read them out, some of them? I can see them. You can go ahead and read them. I can read them? Okay. Yeah, can you okay. see them? I, uh, I, I think I can. Uh, yeah, I can see them. Good. All right. So let's just go back here a bunch. Um, okay, here we go. No. I don't think Israel should be given the, give the Golan Heights to, this, to Syria. No, for military reasons, for security reasons, high ground for Golan Heights, a lot of no's. Of course not. It's dangerous uh, too. Uh, bad to give it back uh, military-wise. No, I don't think they should. It's a security risk and it was one fair and square in a defensive war. If you don't want to lose territory, you shouldn't go, go starting wars, okay? No, for strategic reasons and Syria is an unstable politically. Good point, Diane. We're going to be talking about that at the very end of the class. If peace were really desired by the other side, then maybe, but probably giving up uh, two, uh, maybe saying too much. All right, a lot of no's, some yeses. Mitchell says yes, Israel should be willing, much like we were later willing with Egypt. Israel is founded on the desire to be a good neighbor. All right, and that goes back to Jacob's class from two nights ago with uh, the Declaration of Independence. In you know, in that declaration, Ben Gurion writes, you know, calling out for peace with the neighbors. So interesting. Syria is unstable, strategic. Okay, so we were mostly almost all no's, all right, except for a couple of yeses. Okay, so. That's kind of like a guiding question. Now this, for people who have been like watching, you know, current events for the past few years unfold in the Middle East, we know that there, and this is, we're gonna come back to this at the end of this class, we know that there's a civil war happening in Syria. All right, so it's, it's really not much of an option uh, right now. And just to add to that, if we did give back to Golan Heights in any previous talks, and there have been, there have been prime ministers in Israel before that have been open to and even tried to start Peace talks with Syria, obviously they didn't go anywhere, but there were prime ministers of Israel that were interested in exactly that, all right? Um, but also, if we did ever reach a peace treaty with uh, the Golan Heights, the Golan Heights would be demilitarized, all right? Just like the Sinai Peninsula was supposed to be originally until recently uh, with all the Balagan happening there, but again, that's another topic, uh, but at least on paper, it's technically still. Um, but uh, that, that's another piece maybe to consider. Maybe that would change someone's mind. I'm not really sure. Anyway, just like that's kind of like a, you know, a, a question. And again, we're not seeing it in the newspaper headlines anymore today. But back in, in the day, not that long ago, we saw that every now and then. That, that was actually an idea, right? And maybe I should have put this sticker in the, in the PowerPoint as well. But, um, but um, 
you know, there was a sticker and, and a poster and signs that were, used to be found all over Israel. You can still see them sometimes, right? That there's this white sticker, this white poster that said Ha'am Im HaGolan, which means the nation is with the Golan, which was like the, the people stating their opinion that no way, we're not giving up the Golan Heights, right? There's no way, right? We love the Golan Heights, we want the Golan Heights, da da da. So even without technically answering this uh, question, I'm not going to share my opinion, right? It, it opens up the door to the real question, right, that I want to focus on in this PowerPoint, in this class, right? That's my long preface uh, of this class, which my students are very used to, okay? So then that's the next slide, right? Now, this is the real guiding question of this class tonight. Is why do Israelis love the Golan Heights so much, right? You see so many Israelis, like they love the Golan Heights. No way, we don't want to give it back, right? And of course, you do have people on the other side who are, would be willing, they love the Golan Heights, but they would be willing to give it back for peace. Definitely that's an opinion. Definitely that's a thought in Israel. But I would say, just like we saw here tonight in our comments, I believe, without ever having seen a, a survey, and maybe there, it exists out there, maybe there is one, but just the feeling I get from living in Israel for almost 16 years is that most Israelis probably would not be willing to give them back to Golan Heights. Most Israelis, without going back, we're not going to go back, but going back to that map, most Israelis don't consider, you know, the Golan Heights as like this piece of land that like, you know, is politically speaking on the same level as the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, okay? Um, they don't see it as like this land that's over the green line that was drawn in 1949. Like, oh, I'm crossing the green line to get to the, the Golan Heights. A question we didn't ask, but we'll ask right now, and you can answer in the chat, please. Why don't Israelis look at the Golan Heights, the, which it won from Syria, the same way that, it, that, that they might look at the Gaza Strip and the West Bank? I'll say it again. Why do many Israelis not view the Golan Heights in the same way that definitely many people in the international community, right, but also including many Israelis, look at the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Why do many Israelis look at the, at the Golan Heights as, as just different, and, and, and let's say politically, politically different? They don't look at the Golan Heights as the same as the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. There are Israelis that wouldn't even go into the West Bank because of the Israeli policy of, 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 of Israeli settlements. They wouldn't even step foot in the West Bank. Right? Uh, they would protest against it. Um, they would never live there, of course. But the Golan Heights, the Baba, they might even live there, but for sure they're gonna visit and they're gonna spend time there, right? Why? And now that question, the question on the screen has many answers which we're gonna explore right now, but the question I just asked now is one simple reason. And that reason is because Israel annexes the West Bank in 1981, right? It's the only piece of land that Israel wins in the Six Day War that it, technically and legally annexes according to the Israeli legal system, 1981. It extends Israeli, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, jurisdiction to the Golan Heights, something it never did to the Sinai Peninsula, and it never did to the Gaza Strip, and it never did to the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, except for, of course, East Jerusalem, which it did annex right after the Six-Day War, 1967. Okay, so of all the lands that Israel wins in the Six-Day War, only East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights will get annexed. Again, six day, uh, East Jerusalem right away, and uh, Golan Heights like a good 14 years later. All right, and that's the reason why. It, and that has been so many years since that, that it's just been like, you know, pressed into Israelis' minds of, of course the Golan Heights is, is part of, uh, is, is part of, 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 uh, of Israel. Right? They wouldn't think otherwise. Right? Very much, I would even say, um, Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem over the Green Line, technically in East Jerusalem. I've met hardcore Israeli left-wing activists who are super anti-Israeli settlement, who believe that already yesterday and way before Israel should have gotten out of the West Bank, dismantled settlements and given back the land, right? We're giving the land to the uh, Palestinians. But when it comes to East Jerusalem, they're like, no, that's Israel. That's not a problem, right? And, and many of them even live there. And the same goes for the Golan Heights. They look at the Golan Heights in the same kind of way. It's not this political issue. One other reason why, uh, test your knowledge, so to speak, but what's another reason why the, the Golan Heights is not as politicized in Israel when it comes to Israelis, the way that the West Bank very much is. Why is the Golan Heights not such a hot political, um, very good, Marnie, okay, very good, right away. There's no, uh, well, okay, that's one, there's another reason though. That's one and, it, and it's connected to the second reason, okay? One for the West Bank, obviously Israeli settlements, but what's the other, what's the other reason? And the Golan Heights, unlike the West Bank, you are not gonna find who? There are native people living there, 
So you're on the right track, Mitchell. But they, these native people uh, in the Golan are who and not what? Very good, Gabrielle. Hey, Gabby. Very good. That's my student. Yeah. All right. Um, very good, Gabby. They're, they're Jews. These were Syrian Jews who were living there before 1967. Most civilians and the military, of course, like ran for the hills in the Six Day War from the Golan Heights. All right, but some stay behind, and there is this like uh, Druze community in northern in the northern Golan Heights that now the numbers around 20,000 people. All right, again, that's a whole other topic. I'm not going to get too deep into, but that's definitely part of the story of the Golan Heights as well. All right, but what you so you have the Jews, you have Israelis living in the Golan Heights, of course, also about 20,000. It's about a 50-50 split. Who do you not have in the Golan Heights? And that's the reason why it's not such a hot political issue. Tell me. Who do you not have living in the Golan Heights? And as a result, it's not this big. Okay, definitely not Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Um, Palestinians, very good. There's no Palestinians living in the, in the Golan Heights. This is not Palestinian territory, okay? Uh, it never was, as we learned about before. So that's one of the reasons why the, it's not this hot, politicized kind of issue. All right, anyway, we're already getting into like a lot of politics, but let's get back to the question at hand. Why do Israelis love the Golan Heights so much? And it really feeds into this question that I, I started talking about at the very beginning. What is so Israeli about the Golan? What is it? Why do you think Israelis love the Golan Heights so much? Feel free to, to shoot out some answers in the chat. Some of you already did. If you want to just throw out any reasons why you think Israelis are just so in love. Nature, wineries, farmers. Keep it going, guys. I saw before our security. Wine. It's absolutely gorgeous. Chocolate, strategic. Okay, I love it. Skiing. Very good. You guys, okay, wow. I think all of you guys hit Ellie Cohen. Nice. Um, you Waterfalls, it's pretty. Very good, Jackson. Um, you guys pretty much said everything I wanted to say, so we're just going to wrap up this class right now. All right, I'm going to wish you guys a good night. Just kidding. Okay. But now let's take all your great answers and let's understand that on a deeper level because everything you just said is part and parcel of the reason why Israelis love the Golan Heights so much. And really, I don't know, prove me wrong, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not sure, but I really don't see another land in this land that Israelis are so in love with. Maybe the negative would come kind of close, but I think the Golan Heights even supersedes the negative. Okay. So let's go on. We're going to go uh, to our first slide after this question. Okay. Um, and this is a picture of a place called Tel Fakher. This is on the Golan Heights. And I put this in here because this is like usually the first place we go to as students in the Golan Heights. We'll get off the bus, we'll walk down that very path. And if you can see past the trees on the left side, it's a little bit of a blurry picture. I wanted to blow it up so you guys can see. Exactly, very good. I like to sit right over there with my students and start talking about the Golan Heights, right? Basically everything we just said and everything we will say. All right, and this is usually our first visit right here. All right, what is Tel Fakhir, right? Uh, if you don't mind, guys, I like using the comments as a way to answer questions. I think it's more uh, efficient. So if you just want to say really quickly, if anybody happens to know, what is Tel Fakhir? It's a bunker, very good. We got some smart people on the, on the call tonight. All right, all right, so it, it, what kind of bunker? Do, 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 do. Who built it? Syrian military. Tel Fakhir is T-E-L space F-A-C-H-E-R. Okay, good. So this is a Syrian military position on the Golan Heights uh, with bunkers and positions and everything. What else do you see in the picture? And if you know the story behind it, do not say anything about it, even in the comments. Do you see trees? Very good. What kind of trees? Anybody happen to know? And again, don't say anything more about it if you know what I'm talking about. Anybody know what kind of trees these are in this picture that I'm showing you right now? They look like big olive trees, right? But olive trees don't really grow that big. Eucalyptus. Very good. Remember that. Don't say anything more. We'll get back to that by the end. All right. Here we have this Syrian military position, right? Um, surrounded by eucalyptus trees. Let's go to the next slide. All right, so nobody said this one, actually. This one, this is an answer nobody said. One of the reasons why Israelis love the Golan, or let's rephrase it, uh, why the Golan is so important to Israel and Israelis is the history that's found in there, okay? So let me say this without going to the next slide yet. Tell me how far back do you think Jewish history goes on the Golan Heights? Give me like an approximate year even. It doesn't have to be like 721, just like an approximate century maybe. Right. How many years, or if you want to say X number of years ago, how many years ago does Jewish history go back on the Golan Heights? Give me some good answers over here, guys. 
since the 200s. Okay, good. 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. We got right here something else about 4,000 years ago. We're getting bigger and bigger. Do people agree with that? People think less, way less, just a little less. Long, long time ago, longer than 1967. That's true. Keep going with some uh, more answers. Okay, nah. Okay. Yofi, so the next slide is going to answer that question for us. Let's look at the next slide. Ah, here we see a map of the 12 tribes of Israel going back over 3,000 years, about 1200 BCE. And you can see where Greg is pointing that you can see the area of the Golan Heights, what we would call the Golan Heights today. And you can see the modern state of Israel's borders superimposed onto this ancient map. You can see that most of the Golan Heights was part of the tribe of Manasseh's land. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but you might remember that there were these two and a half tribes, or these three tribes that wanted, that they loved the land so much. Interesting, right? They loved the land so much on the other side of the borders of the land of Israel, they asked Moses if they can stay there. And Moses gets really upset. Why would you not want to go with your brothers and sisters? And then they came up with an agreement. Okay, you can stay here. You can make this your tribal land, but you need to send soldiers over, right, to fight the wars. And then when they're done, you can go home and, and, and start your lives. And that's what happens. We have the tribes of Reuben, God, and half of the nation. They split between inside the land of Israel and outside the land of Israel. But it's interesting to see that going back to the very beginning of Jewish history, how old is Jewish history in the Golan Heights? As old as Jewish history. Okay, according to the stories that, we're, that we learn. Uh, not only in, in the in Nach, but also uh, in the Torah, right? In the five books of Moses, all right? So here we go with that, Yofi, okay? So um, let's go to the next slide. And you can see, what is it in the Golan Heights that we see? We see lots of Jewish history that has been discovered, that has been found by archaeological digging, right? Obviously, this digging for Israelis is happening after 1967, but boy, did we find a lot, okay? Most of, uh, let's say like this, of the over 130 ancient synagogues found in the land of Israel, right? Between a quarter and a third of them have been found in the Golan Heights alone. For this piece of land that, you know, is just a small percentage of the whole land of Israel, right? A huge chunk of the ancient synagogues have been found there. Now, already by the fact that we're, we're talking about synagogues, they can't be three or 4,000 years old because synagogues aren't that old, but they do go back, you know, 2,000 years old plus. Right? And some are more in the, go back to the Byzantine times, some back to the, uh, I should say, more the Talmudic era, okay? But he, uh, here we see one example uh, of, of a synagogue in the, in the Golan Heights. And these are just one of, of many, many archaeological finds in the Golan Heights that reminds us of, of, the, of the depths of Jewish history in the Golan Heights. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, I, like, I realize I like asking trivia questions on Zoom. All right, so tell me, who can tell me what we're looking at? What's the name of this hill, of this mountain? This is in the Golan Heights. Anybody know the name of it? What does it look like? If you don't know the name of it, what does it look like? It looks maybe like, an, like a triangle. What kind of animal does it look like? It looks like an animal. It's not Mount Bantal, good guess though. What kind of animal does it look like? Some say it looks like a camel. Very good, Amy, yeah. Looks like a camel. How do you say camel in Hebrew? Anybody know? How do you say? Gamal. So it looks like a gamal, and therefore, this mountain is called Gamla. All right, this is the, uh, the mountain of Gamla, which housed an ancient Jewish community going back to the first century BCE. Uh, eventually, there were thousands of Jews living on this very kind of strangely shaped mountain. Uh, and if you can look to the left, you can still see some of the remnants uh, of their community. So this is one of many examples, again, of Jewish history in the Golan Heights. Uh, many teachers like to end uh, the Golan Heights teal in this place for their final discussion. Maybe some of you students have actually been there. All right, if you go to the next slide, right, you'll see like a recreation, an artist's rendition of recreation of Gamla on this mountain. All right, with its uh, buildings and with its uh, synagogue and with its wall and with its towers. All right, uh, Gamla, by the way, was destroyed by the Romans during the Great Revolt. Um, after a few attempts of the Romans, uh, eventually they were conquered, they were destroyed. Many Jews were massacred. Some Jews uh, jumped off the mountain, uh, deeming this mountain or leading it to be called the, the Masada of the North. Um, 
and so on. If you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, actually a picture from today of the ancient synagogue in Gamla. All right, so just uh, we're looking at this just to understand that there is great Jewish history in the Golan Heights. It's really deep. It's like wherever you go, go to Katsri and you'll see it and many other places. And that's one of the reasons why Israelis love the Golan Heights because Israelis love their history. They, they love like that, that they're living in this land, where they were, whether they were born here uh, or not, whether they're you know the first generation, second, third, or fourth, fifth, or tenth generation, they love the fact that the Jewish people have returned to their land. And yes, when we go hiking and when we go on a, on a family vacation, we pass like thousands of years of Jewish history. That's just part and parcel of, of what it means to live in Israel in general, very specifically the Golan Heights. What's well, another reason uh, that Israelis love the Golan Heights so much? You guys said it yourselves. Let's look at the next slide. And we can see nature, right? What's so awesome about the nature in the Golan Heights specifically? Tell me in the comments. What is it about the Golan Heights specifically and uniquely? Snow, very good. Okay, we'll get there. We'll talk about that. It's green. All right, when it's green, it's green. But when it's not, all right, it's like brown and golden. And I have to say, when I go to the Golan Heights with students, when it's not that luscious green that it is right now, we're at the peak of the greenery in the Golan Heights, it's still in my eyes gorgeous. The browns, the goldens, it's, it's, it's yeah, maybe it looks, you know, dry, dead and burnt to many people, but there's still like a really deep beauty about it. So to, just the colors, and you can see already in some of the pictures, if you go forward, uh, Greg, um, I just, you know, put in some pictures we can quickly go through. Just a typical site in the Golan Heights, you know, around this time of the year when the wildflowers are just coming out. Oh, uh, look at this picture. Now, I don't know for sure if this was Photoshopped or not. When I first, I go back one slide, sorry. When I first saw this on Facebook a couple years ago, my first thought is totally Photoshopped. My friend uh, who put it out, the one with the purple and the yellow, just go forward one. Um, the My friend who put it out said, I promise you this is not Photoshopped. So, you know, I believe it because it's the Golan. It's like, I can imagine, right? Looks like California, right? It's gorgeous. The color just are, especially this year with all the rains, the, the colors are just exploding in the Golan Heights. And uh, it's, it's a very, very big part of, of why Israelis love the Golan Heights so much. Yes, there are other beautiful parts of the land of Israel, all right? But people love the Golan Heights for its specific beauty. I love taking students on hikes through, through the nature there to really just see the wows and the wonders go forward. Because another big reason why the, the Israelis love the Golan Heights, you can go forward, Greg, right? And some of you guys said this already, is the water, right? I grew up in New York State. I grew up with a stream behind my house that we used to play in and around. I grew up a 10-minute drive from something called Seven Lakes, okay? If you can just go back one slide, Greg, so I just want to talk about that in a moment, all right? Um, Kyra, I'm glad that you're missing Israel so badly. I grew up um, near an abundance of lakes in upstate New York. Right? I, I was just used to water. Water was like a part of our life. It wasn't like a big deal. It, as you know, as in as you, water is not everywhere. So where there is water, all right, uh, it's really flocked with. Literally, it's like, you know, like you think, you know, like this cool secret spot with some water in it. No, you get there and there's like a whole crowd of Israelis there. Right? And this picture here is classic Israel. It's classic Golan, right? It's this little pool that to most Americans before they ever come to Israel would be like, what? Like you would go there to hang out and go into water? Like I have a swimming pool in my backyard or I belong to a country club or I belong to like the town pool, which I did when I was a kid. Like, why would you ever go in that, right? Um, but this is so Israeli. Right, these what we call Mayanot, these springs, right? These like uh, you know, human-made pools that are fed with natural spring water. They're all over the Golan Heights, right? The Golan Heights is dotted with these Mayanot, these springs, and they're small relatively. They're not huge, right? But Israelis flock to them in the spring and in the summertime. They go in, they cool off. The water is usually really cold, um, but it's awesome and it's refreshing, and it's just like this classic Israeli kind of hangout spot in the Golan Heights. Let's go forward. Okay, just kind of zip through uh, some others. The next uh, slide that we see, Greg, is uh, the Mishushim pool, which we, we bring some of our, 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 our students on. You can just see it's really is like having a good time jumping into the water. You see waterfalls, like some of you guys saw before, tons of waterfalls on the Golan Heights, all right, um, that people just love to go and see and hike to, and, and if, if the temperature is right, to go into as well. We can go forward with the slides. Nice, Annette. 
what if I'll go to the next slide and I'll show you, especially for our, our former students here, ah, here's the Jillaboon, right? This is our classic uh, AMHSI, let's just go on back one, sorry, Greg. Uh, this, that's our classic AMHSI hike for the Golan Heights right there. We do about a uh, 45 minutes hour hike until we get to this waterfall. Uh, sometimes we just look at it from above. Uh, if it's uh, warm enough, we hike down and we go into the water. But those students that you see on the right side, you can say those are ours, even though I got it from Google, but whatever. All right. Um, but that would be us, okay? That's us on our Golan hike. And in and, and, and classic uh, amateur site fashion, every teal we go on, almost every teal we go, uh, part of our day is spent outside hiking the land, right, to connect uh, to the land, to create that connection to the land. Very much Israeli, the way that Israelis do in their own everyday life. All right. So, Yofi, uh, going forward with the slides. All right. We see Mount Hermon. All right, Israel's tallest mountain, which is part of the Golan Heights, which did not belong to Israel before 1967. All right, most of it's in Syria, but we do have a, a part of it in Israel. The tallest part of the mountain is in Syria, but we get a good 2,200 meters, something like that, uh, peak in, in there. And yes, in the wintertime, we do have snow. You can go forward one slide. We have this great picture, right? Driving in the Golan Heights and seeing this. It's awesome. All right, just like the snow-capped mountains of the uh, of the Hermon, and that's also part of it. In the winter time, we don't have snow here in Israel. Like I lived in Jerusalem for five years, we got snow one and a half times, you know, and it melts in like thirty minutes. Right, it's nothing like you know growing up in Philly or New York or upstate um, America, Minnesota definitely not. Right, so uh, snow when it snows, and especially the Hermon, people will go there. They'll you can go forward, Greg. They'll go there to ski. They'll go there. You have to, we actually have a, a ski lift in Israel, for those who didn't know. Right, you can go there skiing. Um, people just go up there just, just to see the snow, to make a snowball. Israelis don't make snowballs. They just want to like make a snowball and have a good time. right? Um, and this is also a big part of why, the, uh, why Israelis love the nature of the Golan. Okay, Yofi, going forward. Another big piece, a big topic. I'm going to skim through it. There's so much to say, but I don't want to get bogged down. Wine. All right, some of you guys said it as well. The wineries in the Golan. All right, you guys, you have to understand, and if you're old enough to, you know, uh, to understand what I'm talking about, um, kosher wine used to be the laughing stock of the international wine community. Kosher wine, when I was a kid, was Manischewitz. It was thick. It was syrupy. It was sweet. It was gross. Right, you got those little cups that your synagogue's kiddish. And you eat that like stale cake and like that Manischewitz wine, and you're like super psyched because your parents didn't see you. All right, that was Jewish wine. That was kosher wine for so long. All right, and then, you know, let's, let's think about it. You know, yes, you know, we have a lot of laws about wine. We have a lot of talking about wine in the, in the, in the, in the Talmud. All right, but then we got like exiled. And for a good like 2,000 years almost, like we weren't living in our land. And for most of that time, who was living in this land and controlling the land? The Muslims. And they don't drink wine. Right, so wine pro pro production pretty much fell out of existence for almost uh, 2,000 years in Israel, and then the Jews are coming back. You know, in the beginning of like the Zionist movement, one of the first things that does happen is like the creation of new wineries, but it's kind of small. It exists, yes, but it's kind of small. It's not until Israel controls the the Golan Heights and starts to plant vineyards and open up wineries specifically more into the 1980s. It did take some time, right, with some help from outside, from other countries like France and from Jews living in America who came over here to be like, you know, wine masters. I'm not sure if that's a technical term for them. But uh, eventually they started uh, experimenting and growing and making wine in the Golan. And that literally changed the face, not only of Israeli wines, but wine in general across the world. Um, what used to be the laughing stock of the international wine community became this well-respected uh, partner and, and part of, of the international wine community. Israeli wines, really bolstered by the wines produced in the Golan, have won international wine competition. This is unbelievable. You know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, no one ever, ever thought that would uh, actually take place. So wine is a big part. All right, there's more to say about that, but we'll just kind of skim through that, going through the next uh, slides. That's just the Golan Heights Winery, nice sign, Yofi, and going to the next slide after that. On to another big topic, and again, we can't go too deep into this because there's so many topics that, that connect to the Golan Heights, but a huge part of the Golan Heights and why it's so important to the state of Israel and why Israelis love it is, is, is water, all right? We know, and I think just last night, Seth Siegel gave a great Zoom talk. I was unfortunately not able to be part of it. Maybe some of you were, but um, water obviously is very important. To, uh, to Israel, to any country, obviously, but especially Israel living in the Middle East, right, with its uh, scarcity of water. So this is the whole topic, not to go too deep, but just to say, traditionally, 
no longer. But traditionally, the, the Kinneret was a good 30, 40% of Israel's water needs, providing it, right, from the Kinneret. And if you know that fact, it's, it's essential also to know that a good third of the water that fills up the Kinneret at the Sea of Galilee comes from the Golan Heights, right? Either directly or, or by feeding into the Jordan River from the north, right? So the Golan Heights is the source. It's such an important source of water uh, for Israel, right? That's why Syria, 1965, this is before the Six Day War, 1965, it attempted to divert some of the, the headwaters of the Jordan River, all right? Uh, so it wouldn't flow into Israel, which is against international law, right? But it's what wouldn't, they tried. Israel found out about it. Hmm, I wonder how, we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit, right? But in 1965, Israel found out about it and destroyed the project and the Syrians never tried again. But water obviously is a huge, huge thing. Let's go to the next slide and you can see um, the building of the Israeli national water carrier. An amazing story. When you're talking about Zionism, the story of Zionism and the story of the people of Israel returning to the land of Israel, you can't tell the story without talking about water in general, but this water carrier in specific. Long story, super, super short. This is an idea that Jews in Israel or in the land of Israel already started thinking about in the 1930s. Right. Anyone who knows the McDonald White Papers of 1939 which seriously limited the amount of Jews that can come in to the land of Israel, into Palestine. This, this British limitation on Jewish immigration was very much um, motivated by their fear and concern that there was not enough water in the land to meet the needs of, of a growing Jewish population. When the Zionists heard that, they on one level like kind of flipped out because like, wait, this could be the end of Zionism if there's not you know, proper Jewish immigration. But of course, in Jewish Zionist and Israeli fashion, they got right to work. Led by a man named Simcha Blas, all right, who right away started, started to go into exploring for it and finding new alternative locations of underground water, including the Negev. Seth Siegel talks all about this in his amazing book, Let There Be Water, highly recommend, uh, recommended to read. But another big part of this, uh, this idea um, was, was uh, the National Water Carrier, which they already started to think about at the end of the 1930s, that we need to take the water from the Kinneret and get it to the rest of the country because we have like this huge amount of water in a place where like a huge amount of people don't live and we need to get to a place where a huge amount of people do live specifically in the center of the country. So going forward, you can see the next slide, right? Um, the construction also, this is like a classic Israeli picture, someone standing inside uh, the, uh, the carrier itself. If anybody knows who that is, feel free to say. I don't think it's Ben Gurion, but it kind of looks like him from the back. I don't think, did he have white hair already by the 50s? Yes, he did, so that would not have been him. Okay, uh, but they, they started already like planning it in the 1950s, um, uh, or, but they were even thinking about it in already uh, in the early, early years uh, of the state, and in the 1960s, uh, they're building it. It's, it takes an absorbent amount of money a ridiculous amount of the Israeli budget, but they really believe that this is what we need to do to take care of our growing population. And really they felt this was one of the leading Zionist projects of the day. Let's just kind of make the connection guys. We're like Amy, just like JNF here, right? JNF, you know, you know, in, in addition to planting trees, and I would say even surpassing the importance of, of planting trees, what the, the main thing that JNF is doing today uh, in, in Israel, in addition to all the other wonderful projects that they are uh, spearheading and funding and uh, encouraging and supporting is water water projects in Israel. One of the greatest things that the JNF has been doing now for many years in Israel is building of reservoirs, building of water infrastructure, supporting that water infrastructure. Water continues to be a major, major issue in Israel. It's obviously a different story today because we have desalinization plants and we have reclamation plants. We have the world's leading you know, water reclamation plant uh, in Rishon Lezion. Uh, big topic, again, just gonna skim through it, but just uh, to hear that. Let's go to the next slide. You're gonna see the map of, uh, of the actual water carrier itself. Okay, but moving forward. Okay, we're gonna hit our, our, our last couple of topics here to round up this uh, talk. Security, all right? The obvious reason why security is uh, such an important issue for Israel when it comes to the Golan Heights is, as you can see in the map, the, 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 the topography of the Golan Heights, right? Why was uh, Syria, through its military, able to terrorize Israelis living in the north of Israel for almost two, uh, two decades, the first two decades of Israel's existence? 
because they had the heights to go on heights. They had the upper hand, so to speak, right? They were up on the heights. They, they, they dug in. They built military positions all throughout the Golan Heights, just looking right down into Israel, shooting at will, shooting at whim, attacking. And the conflict is really uh, built on and festered by that. But it's not only that. Going back to our last topic, I didn't mention this before. I was waiting until not to say it, that the conflict uh, between Syria and Israel leading up to 1967 is not only about that Israel is being attacked by Syria militarily, right? but it's also because of this demilitarized zone, uh, the DMZ there, right? they had a dispute of where it actually was, but also water. Water was a huge, huge reason that the Six Day War actually came to be. A little known fact, but if you, if you dig through and get to the roots of the conflict and the roots of the story and the beginnings of the of the tension that led to the Six Day War eventually, you can really see how it starts with water, right? Uh, which is really interesting. We're used to wars being fought over other resources like oil, right? but many people in the world today say that the the wars of the future will mostly be fought over water because, as we all know, fresh water, clean water, is uh, is a resource that's becoming more and more scarce in our world today. Anyway, connecting that, going uh, forward. And again, these are big topics, but we're just kind of doing like a general overview of the Golan Heights. We can see already a, ma a map of the Golan Heights with Mount Dove and Mount Chemon. Mount Dove, for those who know, very important uh, site militarily uh, for intelligence, right? Because we're on the heights and we have like literally like a clear view into Syria, we have multiple points in the Golan Heights that allow us to have, uh, you know, early warning systems that allow us to have intelligence that we couldn't get otherwise, uh, surveillance, right? The joke is that, uh, you know, Israel knows when Assad goes to the bathroom. I don't think it's a joke. I think we actually do. Okay. Um, I think it was, um, um, his name is slipping me. Somebody can maybe help me. Um, the famous U.S. diplomat, Jewish man who uh, helped a lot in the Israeli-Arab countries dialogues, uh, Kiss Kissinger. Right, uh, you know, he used to. Thank you. All right, he used to say the Israelis they, they they look at every little bump in the road as like a as a strategic mountain. Right, they make a big deal out of every little hill. Right, and he said this in in, in relation to the Golan Heights, thinking, what's the big deal? You don't really need it. You think you need it for all these security reasons? Come on, like let's be honest. And then he came to the Golan Heights, and they brought him up to the mountains, and he's like, oh, I get it now. And you get that when you get to the Golan Heights and you stand on these mountains, you go up to Bental, you go up to other places, right? And you see like, wait, yeah, this like literally, we're like looking into Syria and it gives us this incredible advantage uh, in terms of security that we did not have, that we're, we're desperately lacking in the first two decades of our state's existence, which led to major conflict and made, that led to the Six Day War, right? Again, like this put into the story of the Six Day War, the, the Syrians were using the Golan Heights to terrorize Israel for two decades. Right? If they didn't do that, Israel never would have had a reason to take it out of their hands. Right? It's like a kid misbehaving in class. Enough is enough. You're using this to hurt our citizens, to kill our citizens, right? To create conflict with us, draw other nations into the conflict. Sorry, right? We just can't allow that anymore. Going on, All right? Just some pictures. Not going to go deep into these pictures. You can see, right? Government, military using positions on the Golan Heights to understand the situation better. Right, and when we go on our tiulim to the Golan Heights, we sometimes will go to Bental, right, or we'll go to a place that I'll show you guys in a moment, and we'll see, we'll see like top, you know, uh, military officials there, not just for like you know a nice view for their coffee, you know, in that moment, uh, but literally to stand there with their binoculars and 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 learn more about the situation. We're taking our kids to the same places, yes, at tourists go as well, but that high-ranking Israeli, you know, military officials will go. Uh, to help them better understand the situation. Obviously, it's not the only place they're going, but uh, these places are also important to them. So this picture shows us this. Another reason why uh, the Golden Heights, you can go forward, Greg, please, is uh, very important. And it's the same reason why the Negev was very important. It's one of the reasons why Ben Gurion, right, um, you know, put major, you know, effort into uh, and desire into making sure the, the negative was going to be part of the state of Israel, both in terms of the UN partition plan and the war of independence itself, is because it allows for, the, for, for open space, for, for land, for military bases, for military training, right? The, the big parallel, the big commonality between the negative and the Golan Heights is, is the number of tanks you see, the number of bases, right? The, you know, Targilim, exercise is happening just on the side of the road. It's a very classic, uh, well, maybe not exactly this, but you, it, it's very classic, you know, to see Israeli tanks practicing when you go up onto the Golan Heights because we have that space, right, uh, to do such uh, a thing. Going forward,
you can just more pictures. Uh, Greg, you can move forward one slide, another slide then. Right, again, these are just like visual examples of what we're talking about. You know, Israelis um, using the Golan Heights for military purposes, for military training, taking advantage of the open space. It's a huge chunk of land and only 40,000 people live there. Like we said before, 20,000 Israelis and 20,000 Druze, who most of them are not Israeli citizens. Right? Another story maybe for another time. All right, uh, which means that there's a lot of open space. Um, and... Um, I was just going to add now that I think, you know, most people, they go up to the Golan Heights and they say, oh, I'd love to live in the Golan Heights if it just wasn't so far, right? Um, but that obviously adds to the charm and to the appeal and to the specialness of the Golan Heights is that it's kind of like the separate space uh, in the land of Israel. So I know I've said that probably every time I go to the Golan Heights, whether with my family or on tea with my students, like, oh my God, I'd love to live in the Golan Heights if it wasn't just so far from Hodor Sharon. Let's go to what I think is going to be pretty much our last topic here. All right, sub little topic, yeah. And that's how did Israel gain control over the Golan Heights? We already talked about this for the most part, the Six Day War, right? We're not gonna go into the details, but we will just bring up one last thing with the Six Day War. You can go to the next slide, Greg. And that's, of course, Eli Cohen, right? Israel's greatest spy, 1924 to 1965. We are not going to tell the story of Eli Cohen right now. It would take us another half an hour to do so, all right? But there are great websites. There are great books. And now even a Netflix series, right, which many uh, amateur high parent, uh, students, I'm sorry, teachers are not so happy about because that means that many students are now going to know the Eli Cohen story before they get to us. And we love telling them the story on the Golan Heights, but nonetheless, nothing we can do about it. It's still fun to tell them the story, uh, you know, in the place where, where it really happened. But Eli Cohen, right, um, you know, a spy who was sent, uh, who was born in Egypt, uh, it was his grandparents who had to leave Syria, interestingly enough, out of danger, right? And they moved to Egypt. Um, he lives there and, and, and stays there until the 1950s, a good 30 something years, and then moves to Israel. He was, he was from a traditional family, a Zionist uh, community eventually. He was even doing some spy work for the Mossad in Egypt. He realizes in the 1950s, that's not the place for him or any Jew to live. He leaves with his family. They come to Israel. Long story short, again, I'm not going to get into the details, but uh, he basically is recruited by the Mossad to be their man in Damascus. He goes through intense training. Uh, he even gets sent to Argentina for a while to kind of like, you know, create his story and get practice. And then with all of that, go to Damascus and become what will be Israel's greatest spy, collecting unbelievable amounts of uh, very important uh, uh, information for Israel. All right, so maybe I'll just share one or two quick little uh, pieces of the story. You know, uh, I don't know if many people know this, but Eli Cohen's brother Morris also uh, worked for the Mossad. And I think now that Netflix is out, probably more people are going to know this, but whatever. All right. His brother Morris also worked for the, the Mossad. He was kind of like, uh, worked for like the Morse code, but the, kind of like the communications. And um, he was getting all these messages to send to the, you know, guy in Damascus. Of course, they don't know who each other is. Um, but um, basically, his brother realizes after a bunch of messages go through that, that uh, his brother is that guy in Damascus. And on one of Billy Cohen's trips uh, back home, uh, to visit his family to make it look like he has a normal life and he's not this great spy. Uh, Morris kind of like, you know, says to him, uh, oh, I have a new phone number. And Ellie Cohen's like, okay, give it to me. And he's just writing it down. And then the note the Morris uh, gives to his brother Ellie is Eddie's phone number in Damascus that Morris knew because he was working for the Mossad. And Ellie's writing down this number and he like realizes, wait, this is my number. He looks at Morris, you know, and just like, wait, what? He talks to him later on on the side, away from the family, says, you can never do that again. Um, that's another crazy uh, piece of, of the story. Anyway, we're just going to kind of zip through the end here. Eli Cohen, you can go through the slides now, uh, Greg. All right, Eli Cohen, this, uh, the next slide is with him and his uh, uh, wife, Nadia. Um, and then next, this next slide is probably the most you know, powerful slide of them all in his stories. This is him as, uh, you know, uh, Amin Kamel Tabet, his, his uh, fake persona uh, in Syria on the Golan Heights, being you know taken on the Golan Heights to see all the great Syrian military positions, looking into Israel. This isn't Eli Cohen standing there. This is his you know Syrian uh, personality standing there as a spy. It's a very powerful picture, um, and I'll just say that uh, you know unfortunately his story does end very tragically. 
when you go to the, the last slide, right, with him being caught by the Syrians. Some people say it was the Russians who helped him. Some people say it's the Egyptians who helped him. Uh, whatever it was, he gets caught in 1965 and he's hanged in Damascus in front of a crowd of 10,000 people. What's on him is like this big piece of something where they wrote in Arabic, you know, all these horrible things about him and what happens when you're a spy against Syria. But kind of like the, you know, when we look at the Golan Heights, we say, how did Israel win the Golan Heights in, in 1967? Because there were military experts and analysts who, who said that if, you know, before 1967, that if Israel was ever going to try to take the Golan Heights out of the hands of Syria, which they imagined one day would come, it would take months and months and months and months and cost him thousands of, of, of lives of soldiers. And in the end, it did cost Israeli soldiers lives, but not thousands, right? Just like just, so to speak, a couple of hundred, all right? And they did it in 36 hours. 36 hours Israel took the Golan Heights from the Syrians who dug in deep over the 20 years they controlled it. And why? Because Eli Cohen gave them the keys, right? His intelligence that he gathered in the years in Damascus gave him the keys to know everything they needed to know to launch a proper attack. Go to the last uh, slide here, right? And this goes back to the beginning, all right? Um, to This is the beginning of the hike of the Jillaboom. When we get off the bus, we start hiking. We see this is another uh, Syrian military base, all right? With those trees, the eucalyptus trees. And let's go to the next slide, please, Greg. Back to the slide we saw at the beginning where many of our groups will start their uh, learning on the Golan, the Tel Fakhir, the eucalyptus trees, and the story basically is told that Eli Cohen was on the Golan Heights a uh, spy, right, with the top general, and he's looking down below with this general, and the general asks, like, you know, like, what are, like, you know, what's up with all those trees down there? And Eli Cohen, right, says to him, like, you know, um, the Jews, they plant these eucalyptus trees so that they can hide their, their communities and the roads that they drive on so that they can, like, you know, try to protect themselves from our snipers. Right. And uh, so basically, you know, he is like, wow, that's a great idea. We should do the same thing. And then the coin says, I can hook it up for you. I can, I can, I can organize it. I'm going to get you uh, eucalyptus trees and we'll do what the Jews did down there. We'll put them all around our army bases. This was Ellie Cohen's idea. Let's, let's put them all around our army bases up here on the Golan Heights, right, to protect our uh, bases from Israeli eyes. And also let's provide some shade for our Syrian soldiers. The general's like, brilliant, you're, not, you're a genius. Let's do it. They start planting the, the, the trees. And of course, two years later, a few years later, 1967 comes and Israeli Air Force pilots are being told whenever you you see eucalyptus trees on the ground, bomb, right? Because that's where the Syrian bases were. Guys, we're going to wrap this up. I'm not going to finish the last part. Um, I'll just say this. You can already skip through the very uh, end, uh, Greg. Right? We're not going to get to the Yom Kippur War. Obviously, we we're not going to go into the, uh, with depth. These are pictures, uh, Srika Greengold and uh, Victor Kalani, of, uh, of heroes of, of the Yom Kippur War. Syria, or Israel relations today, I was not intending to talk about it. I was just going to mention it like in like a half a sentence. This is uh, the, the, the new-ish security fence uh, between Israel and Syria. Right? I'll end like this, going back to our original question. Right? Before, before the question that we asked, why do Israelis love Israel so much, I asked, why is the Golan Heights so Israeli? And I think we can look back now on our 45 minutes to an hour or so that we just spent together and answer that question because it is so complex and so complicated and so multi-layered and so many things going on on the Golan Heights, right? There's the history, there's the nature, there's the water, there's the security issues, the, the political issues. We didn't even talk about the demographic issues with the Druze. We didn't even talk about Syria today and the civil war that's been happening there. There's so many issues, right? layered one on top of another, right? And while we find that throughout the land of Israel, it really comes to life, I think, in an even more powerful way, specifically in the Golan Heights, right? And that's one, uh, one reason why it makes the Golan Heights so Israeli. Um, and also, again, uh, really, uh, you know, adds to the reason why Israelis love the Golan Heights so much. It's just, it's, it's, it's them. It's like who they are. It's like what they are. It's like what they love, right? From the history, from the nature, from the geology, from the security, from the politics, everything mixed together, right? You can go on a one-day tool and just touch on all these different topics, right? Um, so basically, I want to just say thank you guys for tuning in and uh, taking the time to be with us tonight to learn together. Um, I'm here. If you need to go, um, feel free. I know it's getting late. Um, for some, depending, I guess, where you are. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm also happy to stick around and take any questions if people have or just want to add a comment or anything like that, whether through uh, comments or live, whatever, Greg, you think is best. Uh, and again, thank you so much, everybody.
So Akiva, thank you so much. Um, you took me back to my days of our Golan Tiul uh, with Alexander Moss High School in Israel. Um, please, if you have not uh, emailed me, glitkovsky at amhsi.org, just to let me know you've been on the call. We can share uh, Akiva's PowerPoint with you. And, and shortly, all of our classes, including today's class, will be up on our jnf.org on demand a website. Akiva, thank you. In, it, it, it really amazing day uh, learning about the Golan and feeling like if we can't be there, we can be there with you in spirit, uh, taking a, a tour uh, of the Golan. So thank you so very much. I'm gonna stop recording.